Welcome everyone to episode 50 of the Mysteries Abound podcast. This episode is entitled 10 100 year predictions that came true. 50 episodes, a bit of a milestone in a way. It's taken me quite a while to get there though. And you'll know that if you listen to the Origins podcast, I've been away for a while over on holidays in New Zealand with my wife for a few weeks visiting relatives and because it's school holidays here in Australia, which are just finishing this week, I tend to spend time with my wife rather than podcasting. So that's why not much has happened since November. Anyway, I'm back in front of the mic. Things have quietened down around the house and I can actually get time to sit down and put a show together. And you'll also know if you've been listening to the Origins podcast that it's just over a year since the flood came through and devastated our home. So it's a bit of a bad memory anniversary for us at the moment, but I think we're getting over it slowly. first article this week comes from the www.lifeslittlemysteries.com website. Do ocean waves really travel in sets of seven? And it's by Eli McKinnon. Surf's up bro, but why? Maybe you heard it from a beach bum with a physics hobby. Maybe you heard it from an ancient mariner having a moment of clarity on shore leave. Or maybe you heard it from your dad on vacation. In all cases, The claim usually goes something like this. Ocean waves travel in groups of seven, and the seventh wave is the biggest of the bunch. As would be expected with such a motley group of purveyors, this sea yarn turns out to be well-meaning, but basically false. The short answer for why it's false is that you just can't predict the motion of the great wide ocean that easily. The short answer for why it's sort of true is that, well, sometimes you almost can. To understand why waves don't neatly adhere to received wisdom, you have to follow them to their source. Contrary to another widespread fallacy, the formation of waves has nothing to do with the moon, unlike the rise and fall of the tide. The ocean surface waves that we see rolling onto the beach are caused by one thing, wind. As wind drags over a stretch of ocean, it pulls up ripples and slants on the sea surface. These irregularities become exaggerated as they get steeper and even more receptive to wind drag, rising like sails that magically grow new fabric as they collect more wind. And because waves come from such a capricious progenitor as wind, their subsequent motions, interactions and properties are similarly hard to predict. Robert Guza, a professor at the University of San Diego Scripps Institution of Oceanography, who thinks deeply about waves, put it this way. You wouldn't expect waves to have regular properties, given that they're generated by sort of turning on a wind egg beater. The seven wave maxim does get something right though. Although waves have chaotic origins, once a few of them get going, they do tend to settle into travelling groups choppy, irregular waves that are generated in stormy regions and head off in the same direction will reach a kind of compromise as they go, bucking and engulfing each other until they organise into somewhat stable and predictable packs. As it turns out, the farther these wave groups travel from their source, the more likely they are to fall into a relatively predictable sequence, usually one with a long wavelength or distance between two consecutive crests. Chances are that a long rolling swell coveted by surfers as it reaches shore was born in a far off ocean storm before breaking away from the clutter of short wavelength disturbances at the storm's centre. When you narrow the focus to just these unusually coherent and far reaching wave caravans that humans tend to look for, the seven wave theory starts to hold a little more water. According to Fabrice Veron, the Director of Physical Ocean Science and Engineering at the University of Delaware, the sort of swells we are likely to observe on a fair weather day at the beach will commonly arrive in groups of 12 to 16 waves. That range, coupled with the tendency of wave groups to bundle their tallest waves in the centre of the pack, 
provide a possible basis for the Seven Wave claim. Laurent offered this explanation. A group will modulate the wave amplitude. It's like another long wave on top. So the first wave in a group is tiny, the next one is bigger, and so on until you get to the biggest one in the middle of the group, then they get smaller again. The last one is tiny, so the biggest wave in the group is in the middle, and if there are 14 waves in a group, the seventh wave is the biggest. An electromagnetic pulse from a US radar station in the Pacific is being investigated as a possible cause in the malfunctioning of the Russian Phobos Grunt Martian probe. From the RT.com website, did a US radar down the Russian Mars probe? What began as an ambitious space mission to bring back samples from one of Mars's moons, Phobos, has instead turned into an earthly detective story to determine the culprit behind the failed launch. A government commission inquiring into the performance of the probe, which returned to Earth on Sunday, will test whether it was affected by US radars on its second orbit around Earth. Led by Yuri Kobtev, a former head of Russia's space agency, Roscosmos, the commission announced on Tuesday that it would stage an experiment where a model Phobos will be subjected to radiation similar to that from US radars. Roscosmos head Vladimir Povovkin has said that the malfunction of the spacecraft could have been caused by interference from a foreign technical facility. Experts do not dismiss the possibility that the probe could have accidentally come under the impact of emissions from a US radar stationed on the Marshall Islands whose megawatt impulse triggered the malfunctioning of onboard electronics, Commissant, the Business Daily said on Tuesday, citing an unnamed source in the Russian space industry. The source also explained Roscosmos was examining other possible explanations including the trajectory of an asteroid at the time of the Phobos Grunt launch. The failed mission was more likely due to an accident than to a determined act of sabotage, the commissant source added. Although not specifically mentioned by the Russian investigation team, any investigation into radar bringing down a space probe would have to include the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Team, or HARP for short, observatory established in 1993. The HARP research station, located in Kokona, Alaska, is a hotbed of conspiracy theorising. On this US Air Force-owned piece of real estate, researchers periodically conduct high-energy experiments on the ionosphere, a layer of charged particles that extends up to 1,000 kilometres above the Earth. Whereas similar radar facilities exist in Norway, Russia, Peru and other locations, HARP is the most powerful according to a recent report in Scientific American. Its ionospheric research instrument puts out a maximum of 3.6 megawatts, sending signals at 2.8 to 10 megahertz, powerful enough to heat up a small, on a global scale, but measurable part of the ionosphere. The conspiracy theorists, however, say the facility is up to pure mischief. Former Governor of Minnesota, Jesse Ventura, for example, questioned whether the government is using the site to play havoc with the weather or to bombard people with mind-controlling radio waves. Located in a remote forested area of Alaska, HARP consists of 180 antennas that occupy a rectangle of about 33 acres. Investigators are also considering a short circuit as well as external impact with an asteroid as possible other explanations for the failed mission. They are expected to inform the Roscosmos head of the preliminary results on January 20. The official conclusion is to be announced on January 26, Commissant says. The results of the experiment will allow us to prove or dismiss the possibility of the radar's impact, Koptev says. 
The mystery over the fall of the Phobos grunt has sparked the curiosity of not only the Russian space community, but also that of the country's leading politicians. Indeed, the crash of the Phobos grunt probe appears to be the latest irritant in Russia-US efforts at political reset. Deputy Prime Minister Dmitry Rogozin does not rule out the possibility that the launch of the Martian probe could have failed as a result of US radar impact. This theory has a right to exist, he told reporters on Tuesday. Earlier, Rogozin vowed he would personally oversee the inquiry. I am taking the investigation into the reasons for the Phobos grunt failure under personal control, said Rogozin, who had been Russia's envoy to NATO prior to his appointment to the current post last December. Some Russian observers are quietly leaning towards the conclusion that the United States, in a desperate attempt to cling to its superpower status, both on Earth and in outer space, is willing to conduct acts of sabotage to do so. This opinion is reinforced by the fact that the US space industry, which witnessed its final shuttle mission in July 2011, is now forced to rely on Russian launches to maintain its presence on the International Space Station. This is certainly a blow to Washington's pride and prestige at a time when the condition of the US economy, combined with the astronomical cost of military adventures abroad, preclude further investment in space exploration. In light of these factors, it is reasonable to expect that some individuals in Russia should suspect US involvement in the failed Mars mission, at least until proven otherwise. There had been high expectations from Russia's space community that Phobos Grunt, launched on November 9, would bring back rock and soil samples from the Martian moon Phobos. However, the probe's rocket engines failed to put it on a course for Mars, and it fell into the Pacific on Sunday. Russian efforts to reach the elusive red planet have been riddled with failure. In 1996, Russia lost its Mars 96 orbiter during launch. And this article was written by Robert Bridge. From the www.huffingtonpost.ca website, Weird noise, strange sounds popping up in different parts of Canada. Two bizarre yet oddly similar videos of howling have been recorded in separate parts of Canada, capturing the imagination of YouTube viewers and skeptics alike. The first video, posted on January 13, reportedly recorded strange sounds in a forest in Conklin, a remote community northeast of Edmonton. The unidentified noise, which sounds like it came straight from the soundtrack of a horror movie, has racked up more than half a million views and dozens of comments, many of which question its authenticity. Another video surfaced just a few days later on January 15, with similar sounds apparently recorded in the Paz, Manitoba, more than a thousand kilometres away. Coincidence? We may need Mulder and Scully to investigate. Sounds like a good start to a death metal song, said one user about the first video. Aliens, obviously, another viewer wrote. Sounds like hell opening up, one user claimed. A more sceptical viewer wrote, This video is so fake, people. They are just trying to get some hits on YouTube. Some have suggested it's the sound of a Sasquatch-like creature. Back in October, a group of researchers claimed they were 95% certain that a Yeti was living in Siberia. However, the Yeti evidence was later debunked when one of the scientists who partook in the study told the Huffington Post that the Yeti scenario was likely staged. We think the howling sounds a lot like the dragons in Skyrim. Several videos featuring unidentified sounds have been posted in the last couple of months. A user in Denmark posted one on January 10, which has already been viewed by 60,000 people. Another person in Sweden claimed to have been woken up by what sounded like a train, even though the user allegedly doesn't live near any tracks. And if you want to try out for yourself and see what you think, everyone, visit the show notes at www.origins.info 
and Origins is O-R-I-G-I-N-Z. Click on the Mysteries Abound logo and that will take you to the show notes. Click on episode 50 and then on the link to this article and you'll get a good look at the two videos and you can make up your mind from there. In the year 1900, an American civil engineer called John Alfred Watkins made a number of predictions about what the world would be like in the year 2000. How did he do? From the www.bbc.co.uk website, 10 100-year predictions that came true. And it's written by Tom Gagan. As is customary at the start of a new year, the media have been full of predictions about what may happen in the months ahead. But a much longer forecast made in 1900 by a relatively unknown engineer has been recirculating in the past few days. In December of that year, at the start of the 20th century, John Alfred Watkins wrote a piece published on page 8 of an American women's magazine, Ladies Home Journal, entitled what may happen in the next hundred years. He began the article with the words, These prophecies will seem strange, almost impossible, explaining that he had consulted the country's greatest institutions of science and learning for their opinions on 29 topics. Watkins was a writer for the journal Sister Magazine, the Saturday Evening Post, based in Indianapolis. The Post brought this article to a modern audience last week, when its history editor, Jeff Nilsson, wrote a feature praising Watkins' accuracy. It was picked up and caused some excitement on Twitter. So what did Watkins get right and wrong? 10 predictions that Watkins got right. Number 1. Digital colour photography. Watkins did not, of course, use the word digital, or spell out precisely how digital cameras and computers would work, but he accurately predicted how people would come to use new photographic technology. Photographs will be telegraphed from any distance. If there be a battle in China a hundred years hence, snapshots of its most striking events will be published in the newspapers an hour later. Photographs will reproduce all of nature's colours. This showed major foresight, says Mr. Nilsson. When Watkins was making his predictions, it would have taken a week for a picture of something happening in China to make its way into Western papers. People thought photography itself was a miracle, and colour photography was very experimental, he says. The idea of having cameras gathering information from opposite ends of the world and then transmitting them. He wasn't just taking a present technology and then looking to the next step. It was far beyond what anyone was saying at the time. Patrick Tucker from the World Future Society based in Maryland in the US thinks Watkins might have even been hinting at a much bigger future breakthrough. Photographs will be telegraphed, reads strikingly like how we access information from the web, said Mr Tucker. Number two, the rising height of Americans. Americans will be taller by from one to two inches. Watkins had unerring accuracy here, says Mr. Nilsson, 
the average American man in 1900 was about 66 to 67 inches tall, and by 2000, the average was 69 inches. Today, it's 69.5 inches for men and 64 inches for women. Number three, mobile phones. Wireless telephone and telegraph circuits will span the world. A husband in the middle of the Atlantic will be able to converse with his wife sitting in her boudoir in Chicago. We will be able to telephone to China quite as readily as we now talk from New York to Brooklyn. International phone calls were unheard of in Watkins Day. It was another 15 years before the first call was made by Alexander Bell, even from one coast of the US to the other. The idea of wireless telephony was truly revolutionary. Number four, pre-prepared meals. Ready cooked meals will be bought from establishments similar to our bakeries of today. The proliferation of ready meals in supermarkets and takeaway shops in high streets suggests that Watkins was right, although he envisaged meals would be delivered on plates, which would be returned to the cooking establishments to be washed. Number five, slowing population growth. There will probably be from 350 million to 500 million people in America, the United States that is. The figure is too high, says Nielsen, but at least Watkins was guessing in the right direction. If the US population had grown by the same rate it did between 1800 and 1900, it would have exceeded 1 billion in the year 2000. Instead it grew by just 360%, reaching 280 million at the start of the new century. Number 6. Hothouse Vegetables Winter will be turned into summer and night into day by the farmer, said Watkins, with electric wires under the soil and large gardens under glass. Vegetables will be bathed in powerful electric light, serving like sunlight to hasten their growth. Electric currents applied to the soil will make valuable plants to grow larger and faster and will kill troublesome weeds. Rays of coloured light will hasten the growth of many plants. Electricity applied to garden seeds will make them sprout and develop unusually early. Large gardens under glass were already a reality, says Philip Norman of the Garden Museum in London. But he was correct to predict the use of electricity. Although colour lights and electric currents did not take off, they were probably experimented with. Electricity certainly features in plant propagation. But the earliest item we have is a 1953 booklet Electricity in your garden, detailing electrically warmed frames, hotbeds and cloches, and electrically heated greenhouses, issued by the British Electrical Development Association. We have a 1956 soil heater used in soil to assist early germination of seeds in your greenhouse. Number seven, television. Man will see around the world. Persons and things of all kinds will be brought within focus of cameras connected electrically with screens at opposite ends of circuits thousands of miles at a span. Watkins foresaw cameras and screens linked by electric circuits, a vision practically realised in the 20th century by live international television and later on by webcams. Number 8. Tanks. Huge forts on wheels will dash across open spaces at the speed of express trains of today. Leonardo da Vinci had talked about this, says Nilsson, but Watkins was taking it further. There weren't many people that far sighted. Number nine, bigger fruit. Strawberries as large as apples will be eaten by our great, great grandchildren. Lots of larger varieties of fruit have been developed in the past century but Watkins was over-optimistic with regard to strawberries. Number 10. The Asila Express. Trains will run two miles a minute normally. Express trains, 150 miles per hour. Exactly 100 years after writing those words, to the very month, Amtrak's flagship high-speed rail line, the Asila Express, opened between Boston and Washington, D.C. It reaches top speeds of 150 miles per hour 
although the average speed is considerably less than that. High-speed rail in other parts of the world, even in 2000, was considerably faster. And there were four predictions that didn't come true. Number one, no more CX or Q. There will be no CX or Q in our everyday alphabet. They will be abandoned because unnecessary. This was obviously wrong, said Patrick Tucker of the World Future Society, but also remarkable in the way that he hints at the possible effects of mass communication on communication itself. Number two, everybody will walk 10 miles a day. This presents a rather generous view of future humanity, but doesn't seem to consider the popularity and convenience of the very transportation breakthroughs, moving sidewalks, express trains, coaches, forecast elsewhere in the article, says Mr Tucker. 3. No more cars in large cities. All hurry traffic will be below or above ground when brought within city limits. However, many cities do have pedestrian zones in their historic centres, and he correctly forecast elevated roads and subways. And finally, number four, no mosquitoes or flies. Mosquitoes, houseflies and roaches will have been exterminated. Watkins was getting ahead of himself here. Indeed, the bed bug is making a huge comeback in the US and some other countries. Maybe the end of the mosquito and the housefly is something to look forward to in the year 2100. The following two stories are probably worth a visit to the show notes because both are accompanied by YouTube videos and you really need to see the videos to get the full gist of these two articles. The first is from the www.itn.co.uk website and it's entitled Is this image Princess Diana's ghost or an optical illusion? A video has emerged which appears to show a ghostly looking figure resembling Princess Diana in a stained glass window. The video was shot by Chinese tourists in Scotland and has been described by paranormal writer Michael Cohen, who was sent the video, as one of the clearest paranormal images he has come across. It is understood the footage was taken inside a church in Glasgow, which some who have seen the video say might be significant as the Princess of Wales's mother spent a lot of her life in Scotland, passing away there in 2004. The video takers did not notice Diana when they took the footage, but saw the image when they played their holiday video back when they got home. Michael Cohen said, The footage is currently being examined by myself and other researchers to ascertain if it is a genuine ghost capture. It might be a bizarre optical illusion, but then it could be a ghost possibly Princess Diana's. Ghosts often appear in places connected to their lives and families. Ghosts might appear to warn individuals, groups and even entire nations of possible impending danger. The footage is going to be used in an upcoming TV series on paranormal mysteries. And I've had a look at this footage myself and it actually does look like Princess Diana. So visit the show notes, www.origins.info. Click on the link to this article in the Mysteries Abound show notes. It is worth a look. And the second article in this set comes from the news.gather.com website and it's entitled UFO News Cloud UAP over Rome Mystifies Experts. And it is quite interesting, so it's worth a look, like I said before. In the latest UFO news, a cloud-like unidentified flying object near Rome in Italy is mystifying experts because of its unusual properties. What is it? The UAP, or Unexplained Aerial Phenomenon, seems to be just another wispy cloud from a distance. But zooming in on it, the OVNI reveals a distinct ribbon-like pattern never observed before in known cloud formations and defying meteorological classification. The amateur videographer suffers from the usual lack of skill, 
But when they zoom in on the object, that's when the real mystery begins. Resembling a hang glider shape, without the pilot, the object becomes more solid and aerodynamic the closer the camera zooms in. But instead of the wispiness expected in an otherwise clear blue sky, the UFO takes on a sturdier look as both perfectly sculpted aerofoils tail off into the surrounding area with no visible means of support. The cloud also spins quickly away from the camera, behaving very differently from any weather formation known to experts. It's more like an aircraft under pilot control, but like no aircraft ever seen before. From the www.mysterymag.com website, search for a relic, an article by Martin Jeffrey. For 600 years, one of York's most powerful Catholic relics, the hand of the martyred saint, Margaret Clitheroe, had disappeared. Her house in the shambles is one of the most visited Catholic shrines in England. We wanted to know what happened to the relic, and if it still existed today. Before we set out on our researches, we decided to find out more about the saint herself. Born as Margaret Middleton in 1556 in York, she was the daughter of wax chandler Thomas Middleton and brought up as a Protestant. At the age of 15 in 1571, Margaret married widower John Clitheroe, who was a prosperous butcher with two sons. They married in St. Martin Le Grand Church in Coney Street, and in 1574 she became a Catholic. William Clitheroe, her husband's brother, was a Catholic who is believed to have influenced her to convert. Margaret would often help her husband in their shop, while at night she was playing an active part in helping and sheltering priests in the city. Many of the priests came from Douai in France, but Catholics were under persecution in England and Mass was celebrated in secret. Punishment was extreme, and a priest could expect a traitor's death if caught. This led to priests moving from location to location to avoid being caught, often placing their lives in the person's hands, giving them shelter. Margaret was aware of the danger she was in and the risks involved, but continued to hide priests. She was arrested many times under suspicion, but no evidence was found. The law soon caught up with Margaret, and in 1586 her home was raided. The priest escaped, but Margaret was arrested and never saw her children again. Margaret was put before the judges at Guild Hall, and she was charged with harbouring Jesuit and seminary priests, and with celebrating Mass. Her friends and relatives fought desperately to get her released, because she was pregnant, but this failed. On March 25th, 1586, Margaret met her death at the toll booth on Oost Bridge. She was to be pressed to death by laying a door on her and placing heavy stone on it. She was laid on the ground, a sharp stone beneath her back, her hands stretched out in the form of a cross and bound to two posts. Then a door was placed upon her, which was weighted down till she was crushed to death. Her last words during an agony of fifteen minutes were, Hezu, Hezu, Hezu. Have mercy on me. In 1970, Pope Paul VI canonised Margaret in Rome. Tracing contemporary resources and references, what follows is unusual. Margaret requested to be executed naked, and after death her body was taken to a heap and dumped. It was left to rot. However, a few York Catholics one night carried away the body and into the history books since no one knows where the body was interred. Contemporary reports state that before the body was taken away, whether for a souvenir or as a Catholic relic, her right hand was severed from her body. A few veiled references to her hand appear in various manuscripts. 
one states how her hand had been used during a closed ceremony celebration of Queen Elizabeth I's death, and how another time it could be seen in the old Black Swan on Coney Street. The relic was definitely known about in central York, less than a hundred years after her death, but could it be traced to the present time? We first thought we would check local Roman Catholic religious centres and institutions to see if they knew if the relic existed and its present-day location. Our first stop was the University of York's Roman Catholic Students Group, who surprisingly had not heard of the important relic, and even if it existed. We even contacted a number of local Roman Catholic churches who have to remain anonymous due to legal reasons and they too denied the existence of such a relic and suggested that it did not exist at all. Our real breakthrough occurred during researches in the York Central Library while we were looking for a totally unrelated story. I found an article about the movement of a relic from a church north of York to St Mary's Convent in York in the late 1700s. Could this be the lead I needed? Although not known as St Mary's Convent anymore, the Bar Convent is an elegant Georgian building with a neoclassical chapel with original features reflecting the penal days in which it was built. Catholic worship was forbidden, so the chapel's dome is hidden from outside view by a pitched roof. Eight exits provided escape routes for the congregation in the event of a raid by magistrates, and a priest hole offered further safety. My gut feeling was that St Margaret's severed hand resided at this chapel. It was a rainy day during our honeymoon when we visited the Bar Convent. Not knowing if the relic would be on show, we toured the fascinating museum, but it wasn't to be found. A tall old gentleman stood in the corner. He was a guide for the location. Maybe he would know. I plainly asked him if the relic of St Margaret was housed in the chapel. At first he looked shocked and then smiled. I told him of how I had tracked down the history of the hand and how it seemed to disappear in the 1640s, something of which I found to be a mystery. As he walked up the grey stone stairs of the convent, leading to God knows where, the guide told us the history of the relic. Indeed, I was right to think that it had been taken and was often shown on public holidays and celebrations, but it came into the possession of the convent by their founder, Mary Ward. Mary was a little over one year old when Margaret Clitheroe died, and she had her own Catholic mission. It was Mary Ward's intention to found a religious congregation for women who could be actively involved in the apostolate serving the church when and where needed for the greater honour and glory of God. In the 1620s, Mary Ward established schools in Rome, Naples and Perugia. Mary died near York in January 1645, having failed to get her institution recognised and confirmed by Rome. This confirmation was not given until 1877. It was during the 1640s that, by chance, Mary came into possession of the relic and bequeathed it to the Institute of the Blessed Virgin Mary, which she founded. Since then it disappeared from the history books and out of the sight of the public. We walked into the neoclassical chapel, which was simply breathtaking in architectural and religious beauty. A small wooden panel was revealed, and the guide inserted a large gold key into the keyhole. As he opened it, we saw the red of the velvet interior, and inside was the relic. Standing approximately two and a half feet, the hand was encased in a glass ornate dome with ornate silverwork around it. It was simply stunning. As can be seen by the photograph, it is a fantastic piece of workmanship, and the hand itself is remarkably preserved. The guide also told us that it's believed the hand has healing powers, and from time to time it has been used to cure the sick. Since our discovery in 1998, the convent has made public its relic, and many websites now mention its location, allowing a new generation to see this amazing relic but hardly any will know of its disappearance for over 400 years and its subsequent rediscovery. From the paranormalabout.com website, The Red Glow Incident. 
In early October 1977, while the rest of the family was on a vacation, my youngest brother and I, who at 17 was too cool to be seen within a mile of the parents, finagled a permission from my dad to stay behind, alone at our Fayetteville, Tennessee farm. On Friday night, the night before the family was to return, my brother and I had been in town cruising with friends and returned home late. Our house sat one and a half miles off the road at the end of a curvy drive, winding along a vigorous creek flanked by heavy woods. As we rounded the last curve, we saw that our house was on fire. Or at least it looked like it was on fire. There was a bright undulating red glow originating behind the house, outlining the house in stark relief to the black of the night. The fierce red glow was so bright it illuminated the potato shed next to the house and all the fruit and nut trees behind and beside it. I floored the gas and slid to a stop in the courtyard. We jumped out of the car, intent on getting to the hose between the house and the shed, but noticed something very odd. There was no sound of fire, nor was there any smoke, just the fluctuating red glow. When I say fluctuating and undulating, I don't mean like an ambulance beacon. The light arrhythmically throbbed. There was an almost unnatural silence, even though the typical October breeze was blowing steadily, if not strongly. Our ferocious watchdog, our Rhodesian Ridgeback, was nowhere in the yard. My brother and I stood there for a long moment, rooted in place by indecision and a growing fear. I must say that we immediately began to suspect that this was yet another unnatural occurrence. There were many in my childhood and adolescence in that house built on the foundations of an earlier home, burned in the 1800s to eradicate the death vapours of the original family who perished during a flu epidemic. The five members of that family are buried in a grove on a hill behind the house. Serving frugality, the next property owner merely added onto the existing foundation and built a new home upon it sometime around 1890. My brother and I crept through the yard toward the left end of the house, towards the low rock wall that ran just behind the back of the house from the right end, all the way past the potato shed and the in-law house on its left end. There was about 50 feet of yard between the two structures. No matter how close we neared the left corner of the house, there was no crackling or roaring sound of fire, and there was no smoke. We were literally shaking when we neared the corner, terrified of what we would see in the backyard that could make such a light that our clothing and faces glowed red as we entered the penumbra of the red light. It was, as I have said, a fluctuating light, not steady, but intensely bright. At last we reached the corner of the house. Everything glowed vividly red, pulsating. Finally, quietly, with a look at each other's face, together we peered around the corner. Instantly, the red light was entirely gone, and the backyard was just as it should be in early October. Leaf blown, wispy grassed, empty and dark as night. I don't mean that when we peeked around the corner, the glow quickly extinguished. I mean that the instant we looked around the corner, it was as if the red glow had never been. Like in one of the editing breaks in a horror film, where the guy turns around and he is in another place, altogether different from where he had just been. Immediately we were aware of Rock, the watchdog, barking insanely on the side porch behind us. We never actually saw the red light clear of the house. It is very hard to explain what this felt like. At one precise point in time, we were bathed in a silent red glow. At the next closest possible point in time, we were not. It felt like being plucked from one circumstance and deposited a millisecond before that into another. It was, and then it just wasn't. We poked around in the backyard for a few minutes just to ascertain that the house was indeed not ablaze, and then ran back to the car and left. We drove a short distance to a friend's house and crashed there with him. I realise as I write that this story doesn't seem frightening, but my brother and I were scared to death because it happened, and it happened to us. I can remember every detail of it, the clatter of the fallen walnut and pecan leaves as they walled across the backyard, 
the stark diamonds of the stars against the utterly black void, even the feel of the breeze going through my windbreaker, as clearly as I see the things around me this very instant. It left an indelible mark on my psyche, so strong a thing was it. As I said earlier, there were many unnatural occurrences in the home I grew up in. My family was the fourth, I think, owner of the property after the reconstruction, and the old couple Dad bought the place from had tales to tell as well. Mrs Stewart, they only lived at the end of our drive plus one, told of the haints, and frequently asked over the mailboxes if we ever saw the lady in white. Those are other tales for other times, but I have often suspected that the occurrences we endured were due to having three pre- and teenagers in the house, the type of people often associated with poltergeist activity. At the time of what he and I call the Red Glow Incident, I was 17 and my brother was 12. I make no attempt to explain what the glow was, or for that matter, what any of the occurrences were. I can merely attest that these things happened because I witnessed them with my own eyes, and frequently had other eyewitnesses to them as well. Incidentally, the house still stands and was bought, and is currently lived in by a classmate of mine from high school, he having bought it from the couple who had bought the place from Dad when my parents retired and moved to a lake house with less land to maintain. That couple's adult son died in the in-law house Dad had built for my grandmother after my grandfather's death. I do not know the circumstances of this man's death, just as his parents moved out shortly thereafter. My former classmate has told me that he and his wife have had nothing untoward occur since they bought the place. As I said, there were other things that happened, most of them simple annoyances, some of them even somewhat amusing, others mildly disturbing. But many of them were truly frightening. When the bad ones happened, my brothers and I always left the house for the night, if able. Otherwise, we would stay up all night in the dark, afraid to sleep. I love that old farmhouse, and I have a great many more good memories of life there than bad. But I always, well, feared isn't the right word. Perhaps distrusted it as well. And also from the paranormal.about.com website, The Black-Eyed Salesman. October 2002, Chicago, Illinois. This is a story about a black-eyed salesman that my family and I encountered a few years ago. It was an ordinary day. My mum, father and one of my sisters and I were in the living room watching TV. All of a sudden we heard a knock on the door, which is strange because we had a fully functioning doorbell. I walked to the door and looked in the peephole and saw a black man, probably in his fifties, with a black suit on and a long black trench coat over that. He had an all-black dob hat on and a black duffel or gym bag with him. He creeped me out because I kept asking who it was, but he never responded. I could just see him trying to look into the peephole from outside. So I told my father to come to the door. My father slightly opened the door and I immediately felt fear for some reason. The man was not saying or doing anything in particular to make me feel this way, but it's just the feeling I got. My father asked him what he wanted and he said he had some perfumes for sale and would like to know if he wanted to purchase some. My father was the type of man that would donate or at least hear what you have to say because he knows how hard it is to do that kind of work. My father opened the door wider, signalling for the guy to come in but he just kept peeking around the corner, as if he was checking it out before he entered. My father looked at him and said, Aren't you going to show us what you've got? The guy kept saying, still looking around, Only if you invite me in. I opened the door, my father said. I know, but you have to invite me in, the man replied. Looking baffled, my father said, OK, come in. As the guy entered, he kept staring at me, and I noticed that he had no whites in his eyes. They were totally black. No life in them at all. I immediately closed my eyes and started saying the Lord's Prayer. I kept my eyes closed the entire time he was there. My father never bought anything from him, and he never took anything out of his bag. 
he just kept telling my father that if he bought from him, he would be eternally grateful for his purchase. My father asked him to leave because he never showed him what he would be purchasing. The creepiest part is when I opened my eyes as he was leaving, he was still staring at me, and my mum said he stared at me the entire time he talked. No one knew I was praying, but I felt that this guy or thing could sense it. It was as if he was bothered by it. As he left, we started smelling the scent of fresh roses and flowers. The guy had never ever taken anything out of his bag, so that was strange. We immediately looked out of the window to see if he was there. He should have just been leaving our porch at this time, but no one was there. I went outside to see if maybe he went to a neighbour's house, but he was nowhere to be found. Creepier still, he came back about a month or two later when I was home alone. He had on the same outfit, all black eyes and same bag. This time I never opened the door or let him in. I told him through the door, of course, that we weren't interested in what he was selling. I peeked through the peephole only to find him peeking back, smiling sinisterly. Don't worry, he said. I'll keep coming back. And once again he just disappeared. I'm happy to say I've never seen him again. At this point in the podcast, I'd like to say a big thank you to those people who have provided reviews for the show, whether it be through iTunes, Podcast Alley, or via email. And also a thank you to those people who have sent me links for stories. And a big thank you to these people who have provided a donation to the podcast since the last time I produced one of these shows, which was in mid-November. I may have thanked you already on the Origins podcast, but I'm going to do it again at Mysteries Abound as well. So a big thank you to Kevin McLeod, Rob Poulin, David Brown, Philip Osterkamp, James Mullock, Shay Stevens, Robin Slee, Eric Broomfield, Darren Ludlam and Trevor Rowe. Big thank you everyone, your support and help is certainly appreciated. And if you would like to help the podcast, it's quite easy. If you make a one-off donation using the button on the Origins website at www.origins.info, I'll send you the links to the extended versions of both Mysteries Abound and the Origins podcast, which means you'll get another 30 to 40 minutes of stories tacked on the end of the normal show. And there's another way to support the show as well. That's through the Fine Arts America link. If you purchase some of my photography there and then let me know you're the one who purchased it via email, I will also send you the links to the extended versions of the shows. The music for today's podcast comes from the musicalley.com website, and the bandwidth is provided by TalkShoe at www.talkshoe.com. Now, to bring the podcast to a close, a follow-up to a story that I've done a couple of times on the Mysteries Abound the podcast, the Poe Toaster. And this article comes from the uk.news.yahoo.com website, and it's entitled, Poe Fans Call an End to Toaster Tradition. Edgar Allan Poe fans waited long past a midnight dreary, but it appears annual visits to the writer's grave in Baltimore by a mysterious figure called the Poe Toaster shall occur nevermore. Poe House and museum curator Jeff Jerome said early Thursday that die-hard fans waited hours past when the tribute bearer normally arrives. But the Poe Toaster was a no-show for a third year in a row, leaving another unanswered question in a mystery worthy of the writer's legacy. Poe fans have said they would hold one last vigil this year before calling an end to the tradition. It's over with, Jerome said wearily. It will probably hit me later, but I'm too tired now to feel anything else. It is thought that the tributes of an anonymous man wearing black clothes with a white scarf 
and a wide-brimmed hat, who leaves three roses and a half-empty bottle of cognac at Poe's original grave on the writer's birthday, date to at least the 1940s. Late Wednesday, a crowd gathered outside the gates of the burial ground surrounding Westminster Hall to watch for the mysterious visitor, yet only three impersonators appeared, Jerome said. The Gothic master's tales of the macabre still connect with readers more than 200 years after his birth, including his most famous poem, The Raven, and such short stories as The Telltale Heart and The Pit in the Pendulum. Poe's The Murders in the Rue Morgue is considered the first modern detective story. Jerome, who was first exposed to Poe through Vincent Price's movies, believes people still identify with Poe's suffering and his lifelong dream to be a poet. He has kept a vigil for the Poe Toaster each year since 1978 and built up a team of other dedicated Poe fans who stay awake all night to scan the shadows of the burial ground for the visitor. I've been part of a ritual that people around the world read about, he said. I'll miss it. One Poe tradition may have ended, but Jerome said a reading of tributes by Poe fans at the graveside, planned for Thursday night, may develop into a new ritual to mark the writer's birthday. Jerome says that wherever he travels, he's asked whether the Poe toaster is real. He believes the mystery of the Poe toaster tradition will remain in the public consciousness despite the end of the visits. That mystery is what has kept Jessica Markson, 33, a programmer from Randallstown, coming back to watch for the Poe toaster for years. She and her sister Jeanette, 31, an administrative assistant, got involved after Jerome visited their high school and recruited them as volunteers at the Poe House. Though she has watched for the Poe toaster for years, Jessica Markson said she wouldn't want to know who he is. There are so few mysteries, she said. It's a throwback to a more romantic time when people could have secrets. Poe, who was born in Boston, lived in Baltimore, London, New York, Philadelphia and Richmond. During a visit to Baltimore in 1849, he died under mysterious circumstances at the age of 40. The cause of his death has been the subject of much speculation over the years, with theories ranging from murder to rabies. Poe was buried in his grandfather's lot in Westminster Burial Ground in what is now downtown Baltimore. In 1875, his body and that of his aunt and mother-in-law Maria Clem were moved to a prominent spot by the entrance with a memorial marker. The body of his young wife and cousin Virginia was exhumed and reburied with him ten years later. Baltimore recently cut funding for the museum at the Row House where Poe lived with relatives from 1832 to 1835 before he found fame as a writer. It must close if it does not become self-sustaining by June. The city plans to release a recommended business plan by the end of March. The annual graveside tribute was first mentioned in print in 1950 as an aside in an article that appeared in the Evening Sun of Baltimore about an effort to restore the cemetery, Jerome said. When Jerome spoke to older members of the congregation that once worshipped at the church, they recalled hearing about a visitor in the 1930s. The visitor has occasionally left notes with his tributes, but they haven't offered much insight into the identity of the Poe Toaster. A few indicated that the tradition passed to a new generation before the original visitor's death in the 1990s, and some even mentioned the Iraq War and Baltimore Ravens football team, which was named for Poe's poem. The vigil inside the former church is closed to the public, but over the years a crowd has gathered outside the gates to watch. After the Poe toaster failed to show in 2010, last year's vigil attracted impersonators, including a man who arrived in a limo and a few women. The crowd that gathered outside the gates of the burial ground into Thursday morning was more respectful than last year. Even the impersonators were more solemn, perhaps because of the sense that this could be the last vigil, according to Sherry Weaver of Randallstown, who works in finance. Weaver and a few dozen others, some from as far away as California and Chicago, braved a windy night with temperatures around 30 degrees, hoping to capture a glimpse of the mystery visitor. Some people held out some optimism, but this may be the end, she said, as dawn approached, and it was becoming clear that the Poe toaster was not showing up for a third time. People know this is not a fluke. It's a quiet end.
everyone. That brings a close to episode 50 of the Mysteries Abound podcast. I hope you enjoyed today's show and with the dawning of 2012, I hope that I can get my act together a bit better this year and produce more shows on a regular basis. So until next time, it's bye for now, everyone.